So now let's analyze some simple RC circuits. So we'll use the one we uh, discussed in the last video. We have a resistor and capacitor in series. Except this time I'm going to consider that I can change the input voltage as a function of time and then that I can come here and measure and measure the output voltage as a function of time. So this is very similar to what we did uh, in the previous video when we introduced the capacitor. And now in general I'll have a current flowing through these two components, I, which will also be a function of time. And since it's the two parts in series, the current flowing through the resistor and the current flowing through the capacitor must be the same due to Kirchhoff's current law. So there's only one current, we'll call it I of T. So for the resistor we have Ohm's law, V equals IR, or the voltage across the resistor divided by the resistance is equal to the current. And we have our law for the capacitor that says that the current flowing through the capacitor is equal to the capacitance times the time derivative of the voltage. Now remember what we really mean is the voltage across the capacitor, but since I have this end of the capacitor plugged into ground R0 reference, it's just the voltage V out at this point. So there's only two voltages in the system, V in that we're controlling and V out that we're measuring. And since there's only one current, I can combine these two laws very easily and get our final equation. So now let's assume a particular form of the voltage for our inputs. Okay, so we considered a general voltage uh, input and output as a function of time. But now let's uh, particular, pick a particular function. So what we can do in the lab is very easily we can change this to be a sine wave. So I can write my function of a sine wave like this where this number here would just be a number, V, which would be the amplitude. So on our instrument we could set that to one volt or a half volt or whatever we want. But that's the amplitude of the sine wave. And this number here, omega, is the frequency. And when I write it as sine omega t, that means that's the frequency in radians per second. So how fast is uh, the sine wave oscillating? And what we'll observe in the lab, and I'm not going to prove that this is true in any sense, but we'll observe it to be true, and it actually is true, but that if I put a sine wave in, that I, the only thing I can get out is a sine wave of the same frequency. And so I'm going to write the output as some factor A times our input voltage that we've controlled times the sine of omega t plus some phase or some angle. And so what that means is we go into the lab, there's V in and there's V out. So what we'll always see is that there's some factor of the amplitude may have changed here, right? So I put one volt in and I'm getting, oh here, maybe three quarters of a volt out. So the amplitude has changed, so that would be this factor A. And the other thing is that our peaks aren't lining up. So if I look at this peak and this peak, and the difference of those would be the phase. So it turns out to be true of any linear system, that if I put into any linear circuit that's composed of resistors and capacitors, the only thing that can come out is a sine wave of the same frequency, but shifted in phase and shifted in amplitude. So this will always be true. I'm not going to prove it to you, but we'll observe it to be true in the lab. So if we go in the lab, we set V and omega to anything we want in the input, Everything we observe coming output is going to be the amplitude and phase. And what's cool about this is now the only thing we need to describe the system is we need to know what A is and what this angle is. And that we can figure out using our equations. So there's our equation. And there's our assumed form of the input and the output. And so again, what we're going to try to do is use this equation and our assumed forms of the input and output to find expressions for the amplitude and phase of the output. Because the input is known, it's something we're controlling. And I'm going to use the different color here just so we can figure, remember what term we're, is which. So the first thing we need to do is we need to take dv out dt, which is very easy to do because we know how to take the derivatives of sines and cosines. Sine turns into a cosine and I pull out a factor of omega. So there I have my equation, now I've substituted my values in. And so now again we have to re reduce this and figure out what's A and what is omega. So the first thing you might notice is every term has a V in it so I can cross all of those out. And the second, it's not sort of clear how to proceed because we have these uh, cosines of omega t plus uh, the angle. So what we have to do is uh, resort to our trigonometric identities which you probably don't remember because I never remember them. So I always look them up. So here's one of the tables I have. And what we'll use to reduce our formulas are these right here. So remember these relationships, sine of u plus v or minus v is equal to sine u cosine v plus cosine u sine v. So these sum and difference formulas 
that you have probably seen before but may not remember. Uh, we're going to use those on these terms here. So I'm going to rewrite that cosine term using my uh, form my trig identities. So using my uh, trigonometric identities, I'm going to rewrite my equation as follows. And so now we have to come up to a, an important uh, observation here, which is that now I have this expression that is equal to itself, and it has functions that look like cos cosine of omega t and sine of omega t. And now it's important to realize that in order for this equation to be true at all times, what I'd have to do is group all the cosine terms and all the sine terms, and both of those would have to be equal to zero. So let me refactor this equation. So when I refactor that equation and I group all the terms of sine omega t and all the terms of cosine omega t together, in order for this equation to be true at all times, this factor here in parentheses must equal to zero, and this factor here in parentheses must equal to zero. And so those will be the two equations that give us our relationship for the amplitude and phase. So now let's figure out what those are. So now let's look at the cosine omega term and set that equal to zero. And so since the constant out front in parentheses must equal to zero, the piece that changes with time doesn't matter. Now we see we have an a constant to each term, so those go away. And now I can rearrange this by recognizing that uh, the ratio of sine and cosine is the tangent and get the following expression. So now I have a relationship for the phase as a function of the frequency. And now it's important to remember that when I take my resistance in ohm and my capacitance in farads that that product is in seconds. So time times a frequency gives me something with no units. And so that, that's consistent with it being the tangent of an angle. And it's also important to think about what this looks like in the limit. So at low frequency, as the frequency goes to zero, or as a small number relative to RC, so this product RC omega is a small number, then the phase between the input and the output goes to zero. So that means that if I have an input signal and an output signal, they're nearly identical in terms of phase. If I take the other limit where RC omega is going to a big number, so the frequency is high, then my phase would go to minus 90 degrees. So I have kind of a low frequency limit and a high frequency limit. At low fre frequency, there's no phase difference. At high frequency, it limits to minus 90 degrees. So it means I put, in this limit, it means I put sine wave in, I get a minus cosine out. And this is something we can confirm in the lab. But now I have one of my relationships. I have a formula for the phase as a function of frequency and the parameters of my circuit. And there's only one, the product of R and C. So now let's go to the other, the sine omega t term from our expression a little while back. And again, since we're looking at the point where this is gonna be zero always or always true, it can only happen when this term here is equal to zero. So now we have to do a little bit uh, of rearranging. And so now you'll see we only have A showing up in one thing, and that's what we're trying to find. We're trying to find out what A is. So I can rearrange this, and when I rearrange it, I get a formula for A. Now it's a little hard to see what this looks like because it's also got the phase sort of uh, wrapped in here, right? Because we also have this relationship from our other equation. So it's a little hard to see how this behaves, but let's look at it in at least one limit. So remember in the low frequency limit here, uh, the tangent goes to zero or the phase goes to zero. So if we take the limit of omega going to zero here, we see this term would be small sine of something like zero looks like zero, so that term kind of goes away, and cosine of zero goes to one. So in the low frequency limit, A goes to one. So in low frequencies with this circuit, both the amplitude and the phase of the output are very, very similar to the input. The other limit of high frequency is maybe a little harder to see, but remember, At high frequencies, my phase goes to minus 90 degrees. So let's look at the, the high frequency limit in terms of A. So the high frequency limit, the cosine of minus 90 degrees is equal to zero, so that term goes away. And the sine of minus 90 degrees is approaches uh, minus one. 
So in the high frequency limit, the amplitude A of the output relative to the input goes as RC omega. So as the frequency goes high, this number gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and the amplitude of the output gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So there's these two relationships which you may uh, not remember or may not have seen before, but they're true and you can look them up, which is if I have the cosine or the sine of the arctangent of a function, I can write it in the following form. And so we can use this um, to reduce the form of our amplitude equation. So if you remember our amplitude equation looked like that. Our phase equation looked like that. So you can see if we substitute these in, we have the cosine of the arctangent and the sine of the arctangent. By simply plugging in our trigonometric identities, uh, we could get the following relationship, and I could kind of rearrange this thing by multiplying and dividing by RCs and 1 over RC omega square roots. And what I would get is a final result that's in a slightly more convenient form. Now, I wouldn't expect that you would know to do this uh, unless you'd seen it before. So the form that we had before in terms of the angles is actually okay. We can plot it and whatnot very easily, right, as a function of frequency, but it's not very easy for us to see the behavior. But here it's a little bit easier. Now we can see our limits quite nicely. As RC omega goes to a small number, so the frequency is low, our amplitude of the output relative to the input goes to 1. And as this goes to a big number, then this thing dominates over 1, so we can sort of ignore the 1, the square and the square root cancel. And in the high frequency limit, we have our amplitude going as 1 over RC omega. So our two functions then are the following. And what we normally do is we put these on a plot. We normally stack them one on top of each other. And what we normally would do is we'd plot this in terms uh, on a logarithmic scale. So let's just do the case where RC is equal to 1 second. So when, when we plot logarithmic scale on the frequency axis, then we go up in powers of 10. 1, 10, 100, 0 0.1, 0 0.01. And again, this will be in radians per second. And the convention would be for us to also plot the amplitude on a log scale. And since in this case I know the amplitudes can be bounded between 1 and smaller numbers, I'm just going to do something like that. So if we plot our two limits, our low frequency limit, our amplitude is equal to 1, and our high frequency limit is going to be 1 over RC omega, which means for every factor of 10 in frequency we go up, we go down a factor of 10 in amplitude. And this plot it might do something like this. So those are sort of the two limits. And what the real curve would do if we plotted this would, would sort of round that corner out. So it would look like our limit out there. And it would round out and look something like that. So the sort of pink line would be our true function. And we can actually plot it, but here I'm just sketching it. But it's always nice to think about these two limits. So we have one that's flat and one that's flat. And the reason this curve is a straight line is because we're in log log coordinates. So a line that looks like the frequency to some power just shows up as a straight line in log coordinates. So that's something we'll talk about a lot in class. And we can also plot the same thing um, here. And now the convention would be to plot linear for the phase. So our two limits would be 0, 90. And if we look at our expression, when RC is equal to 1 and the frequency is 1, then the arctangent is going to be right in the middle at 45 degrees. And so what that means is our function is going to sort of interpolate between our two limits. So it might look something like that. And so this plot where we plot the amplitude of the output and the phase of the output as a function of frequency is called the Bode plot. And this is something we'll look at a lot. So we'll, we'll analyze these kind of things a lot in our course. And we'll measure them experimentally. So we can actually build the circuit that we just uh, did on pieces of paper. We can build it in the lab. And we can use our instrument to sweep the frequency and measure the amplitude and phase. And we'll actually see that this is the result that we get. Now, just to make sure that I'm not lying to you, uh, here is a uh, plot I generated uh, on the computer uh, of these exact functions. So this action axis here is the frequency in radians per second. This axis here is our phase in degrees. And this is that factor A of the amplitude of the output relative to the input on our logarithmic scale. And we see the two behaviors. We see the amplitude here is 1, 
and here again is our frequency of 1 and just for simplicity I've set my RC value to 1 as well so you see this sort of transition from amplitude of 1 to 1 over RC omega here and as predicted right here at a frequency of 1 we see that's where the phase passes through 45 at low frequency we see it limit to 0 and at high frequency we see it limit to minus 90 degrees so this is the uh, exact plot Okay, let's consider another RC circuit. So very similar, but I'm basically just gonna switch the order of the resistor and the capacitor. So again, I'll have the input voltage here at this side of the capacitor that I'll control. I'll measure the output voltage there and uh, we'll find out what happens. Now, we analyze this circuit in exactly the same way that we did before. So our, our equation for the resistor is gonna tell us that the current is equal to V out divided by R because here we have V out minus zero, so it's a voltage drop, it's just V out divided by R is the resistance. Now our law for the capacitor is gonna tell us that the voltage drop across the capacitor, that the time derivative of that voltage drop is gonna be proportional to the current. So here I'd have to do V in minus V out. Right, so the voltage drop, the time rate of change of that is equal to the current. And again, since there's just two components and I'm just measuring the voltage of this node, the current through the capacitor and through the resistor the same. I can combine these to get a simple relationship that tells me that RC d by dt Vn minus V out is equal to V out. And we can proceed in exactly the same way that we um, did in the last problem. So I can assume that Vn is going to be a sine wave. So I'm going to hook the input of our circuit up to a sinusoidal source just as before where I control the amplitude and the frequency, I can assume that V out is some amplitude factor and that it's at the same frequency, but perhaps it is shifted in phase. So proceeding, uh, it's exactly as before, right? Because I could easily take the time derivative of V in and V out. So following the same procedures as before, if we simply substitute our assumed forms of the input and the output being sine omega t and sine omega t plus a phase, we can use our trig identities to again solve for the amplitude and phase. And we get a form that looks a little bit unusual, but using the same sort of relationships between the cosines and the arc tangents, we can reduce this to a simpler form. And I won't go through the details because they're in the notes, but if I use those same relationships, we can reduce our amplitude equation here to be the amplitude is being RC omega divided by. And this function has a little bit different form. We see some similarities as before. So we have a relationship between the, the angle, which is one over RC omega, whereas before it was just RC omega. And we see something a little bit different here. But if we think about the limit as RC omega is a small, small, small number going to zero, we see something is quite different than the previous one because if if, the bot, if RC omega is going to zero, the bottom goes to one and the top goes to zero, so the amplitude goes to zero. On the other hand, if RC omega goes to infinity, the amplitude limits to one. And you can prove this self by plotting it and rather than going through and as, as we did with the other one, let me just show you the graph right away. So again, this axis here is frequency in radians per second. Again, as with the previous example, I set RC equal to one, and so this is our amplitude, and this is our phase. So at low frequency, on a log scale, see this is log, log, we have this dropping off behavior. So as we go to low and lower fre frequency, the amplitude goes to zero. As we go to higher frequencies, the amplitude goes to one. Here, the phase goes to 90 degrees at low frequency, and zero at high frequencies. So at high frequencies, the output and the input are similar, whereas at low frequencies, they're attenuated. So just to summarize now, if we have our circuit in this configuration, we have resistor, capacitor. This is V in, this is V out. The amplitude of the output relative to the input is unchanged at low frequencies and then drops off. The phase unchanged at low frequencies and then dropped off. And again, this is the case where RC is equal to 1. If we changed RC equals to 10, then this whole curve would just sort of shift out and where the sort of knee here between the flat region and with this drop off 
would just be shifted over. Or if I made it lower, it would just shift. So this curve would look the same regardless of the value for RC, just the axis would change. And the phase again goes from zero, passes through 45 at our frequency of one, and then limits to zero. And again, if we change our RC values, we would just shift this point over further to the left or the right, depending upon if it was increasing or decreasing. So we have resistor and capacitor, the drop off is this. This behavior here is called a low pass filter. And we'll use it a lot in class to basically uh, reduce high frequency noise from a signal. So it's called a low pass because the low frequencies pass through unchanged, whereas the high frequencies are attenuated. If we simply swap the order of the resistor and the capacitor, this is the behavior we have. So again, we had V in here and V out there. So this is the amplitude of the output relative to the input. In this configuration, at high frequencies, the amplitude of the output is one and the phase goes to zero. So high frequencies are remained unchanged. So this is what we call a high pass filter because it allows the high frequencies to go through unchanged. And again, these plots here are showing RC equals to one. And so if I increase that value, I would just simply shift this knee over further. And if I decreased it, it would shift over this way. So the value of RC shifts the frequency where this sort of transitions from this straight line behavior here, falling off in this kind of flat region there. So our value of RC selects where that is. Now, when we take, we can, again, we will take these kind of measurements in the lab. And the only thing you have to be a little bit careful of is Typically in the lab, what we'll record is not radians per second, but hertz. So there'll be a factor of two pi between often what you measure in the lab and what you calculate on a, on a piece of paper. Um, so you just have to remember in the lab, hertz is cycles per second, where radians is radians per second. So there's a factor of two pi, the distance around the circle. So that's just one little thing to be careful of. Now we just saw that we can build a circuit like this that has a resistor and a capacitor in it we can assume a sinusoidal form for the input voltage and a sinusoidal form for the output voltage. And our task was to solve for these variables, the amplitude or relative amplitude of V out to V in and the phase. And in order to do that, we had to use a lot of trig identities, which I never remember. Uh, in a few lectures, we'll actually uh, show you a simpler way to do this that involves using complex notation or complex numbers. And it sounds harder because we say complex numbers, but it'll actually turn out to be easier. However, there's a lot of overhead to doing complex numbers. So we're going to delay that for now. We're just going to stick with sines and cosines. So I don't want you to be discouraged by the fact that we had to know all these trig identities and kind of do a lot of work to get to the amplitude and phase. We're going to show you a simpler way to do this later. So if we have our friend, the capacitor, there's a simple way to think about the low frequency and the high frequency limit. So when the frequency goes to zero, the capacitor acts like a cut wire. So the symbol is accurate in low frequency. It says, I've gone in and I've snipped a wire in half, so no current can flow through there. In the high frequency limit, it acts like a wire, and so current is free to pass, and there's no voltage drop across it. So let's see how this thinking can be applied to our two circuits. So let's start with a simple low pass filter. So at low frequency, it's as though the capacitor isn't there, and so our endpoint, our output voltage, is just floating uh, because there's no current that's allowed to go to ground. Thus, V out equals V in because there's no current flowing through here, so there's no voltage drop across the resistor. Our output voltage and our input voltage are about the same. At high frequency, our capacitor is like a wire, so it's as though we've shorted it to ground. So V out goes to zero, so it's about zero. And this is our behavior, right? Because in this we saw as a low pass filter. So at low frequency, the output and the input are about the same voltage. At high frequency, the output voltage goes to zero. And our thinking also applies to this circuit. So at low frequency, it's as though this thing is cut, right? So it's completely separate. And since there's, since no current can pass through here, it's like we have sort of two separate things. It's like we just have the output voltage connected to ground through a resistor, and so nothing is happening here, so V out is going to equal zero because it's completely disconnected from the input. At high frequency, our capacitor becomes a wire, and so it's just a wire connecting V in to V out, and so therefore V in is approximately equal to V out, and this is exactly the high pass filter. At low frequency, our output voltage is at zero. At high frequency, our output voltage equals the input voltage.
So this simple model that we uh, have of the capacitor of just thinking about at low frequency, it's like we've gone in and we've clipped the wire and so there's no current that can pass through that capacitor. And at high frequency, it's like that capacitor has become a wire and so things are free to, a current is free to flow through there.